Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss how the government are sneaking through a bill to remove our rights to a whole range of healthcare provision as they push for an ever weaker NHS before our entire healthcare is fully privatised. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, whenever the government, any government by the way, this isn't just Boris Johnson, this is a general rule, whenever a government are under fire for a particular crisis and there's something on the front pages and it's not going anywhere anytime soon, always be on the lookout for what they are pushing out in the chaos. While we're all looking over here, what are the government doing over there? You know, sometimes there'll be certain things they have to announce that are going to look quite bad. And on a slow news day, it would be on the hoodline news and you don't really want to draw attention, attention to it. So you know, it was like the phrase, and this is from Tony Blair's time, good day to bury bad news. This is, uh, that's what he's done. It's like, oh, there's a load of stuff occupying the media. Press release, because none of them will report on it. There's too much going on. Even legislation legislation that won't face proper media scrutiny because there's something more newsworthy being talked about. And while the media are throwing corruption scandals and migrant distractions our way, the Department for Health and Social Care is taking the opportunity to massively weaken health and social care in this country. You know, while the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, is supposed to be getting us ready for, for a winter of COVID that, you know, is going to cause devastation if left unchecked, he is leaving it unchecked to push his real agenda, removing services from the NHS. Sajid Javid is a committed privatiser of healthcare in this country. I mean, look at it logically. So let's say you were someone who wanted to transition from a publicly funded healthcare system, free at the point of access, to a fully unregulated US style healthcare system where the fear of bills will have someone in urgent need of hospital treatment begging onlookers not to call an ambulance because they can't afford it. What would you do? You can't just announce that you're privatising the system. People would go mad. The Conservatives would never win power if they were honest about what they were doing to the NHS. Most people have no idea that a significant proportion of NHS services are already privatised. The Conservatives get away with it by promising to fund the NHS and promising that they love the NHS, but in actual fact, when everyone's looking elsewhere, they just knock it down. But there are several things you would do, aren't you? First of all, you need to underfund the NHS. You have to make sure that it cannot keep on top of healthcare needs. You know, if the current system works, you're not going to persuade people it needs a different system. So you have to stop the current system working. So you underfund it. That way you say the system doesn't work, we need something else. I know, maybe we copy the United States. They're, they're, they're the modern society. They're the biggest uh, country in the world economically. You know, they must know what they're doing. Of course, healthcare in the United States is actually shocking due to the difficulty in accessing healthcare for most people. Problem is that someone will just point out that the government underfunded it. It's like, no, yeah, you haven't been funding it properly. You said you would. So you need a way of underfunding it while making the books look like you're pouring in record amounts of money so that when people say, no, you're, you're underfunding it, they can say, no, actually, you'll see that the funding has gone up year on year. And the Tories have solved this one. They've cracked it. See, by forcing the NHS to issue private contracts for a load of services, like cancer treatments last year, you get to throw a lot of public money through the NHS's books. It's like, NHS funding, look, it's gone up. But it's going to private companies. And because it's private companies, a load of that money has been skimmed off as profit. It's not even like it's just, well, the healthcare's still being provided, isn't it? A load of that money's going off as a profit. So if you were to get that NHS funding pot, and you were to say, so, OK, so if we deduct the money that purely went into profit, not just went to private companies, but went into profit for those private companies. So so then we are left with the actual amount of funding that went on healthcare, You would see that the overall level of healthcare funding has gone down under the Conservatives. But it's not straightforward to do that because the government aren't going to provide the figures on that. And because those profits of private companies, they're not going to be all that keen on making it public, very difficult to get the information to make the calculation. The second thing you would do is prepare people for the notion of paying for healthcare. Like, you know, people like this, we've grown up with the idea that, you know, we pay it through our taxes, but essentially when we need healthcare, it's free at point of access. That was the whole point of the NHS. You know, the idea of the NHS wasn't free healthcare as such. People bill it as free healthcare. It's not free. 
It's just that everyone would contribute according to their means via a tax called national insurance. So it's still an insurance based scheme. It's just that one people paid according to their means. The care then would be free at the point of access. So everyone, rich or poor, knew that when they needed treatment, they would get it hassle free. So the government have to change our minds on that. They needed to start us paying for treatment so that we're, all, we're okay with the concept of paying for treatment. Two ways to achieve this. Firstly, by applying a means-tested charge for certain types of treatment. This is already in place. You know, we already have uh, a subscription, uh, uh, sorry, subscription, a prescription charge. There's also dental treatment. I needed dental treatment last week. Um, NHS treatment, but I still paid something to it, towards it. It wasn't the full amount I'd pay if it was private, but I paid something. So you get used to it. Car parking charges at hospitals are also a form of this. And more will come online. And more will come online as a result of this bill. The second way is to squeeze services so much that those who can afford it go, right, I, can't, I need this treatment. I, I'm getting nowhere on the NHS. I'll just go private in order to get that treatment in a timely manner. You know, despite paying enough through taxation for a properly resourced NHS. I, I've had to do this a couple of times. It's actually quite galling because you pay for privatised healthcare twice. Once directly to the provider who is who's giving you the treatment that you desperately need. But again, by paying taxes, the, the government are forcing the NHS to funnel to private companies. And it also hasn't escaped my attention that as many, not all, some of them are honest, but as many of these private companies bribe the Tories with donations to get those contracts, I'm effectively also funding the Conservatives as well. But as annoying as it is for me, it's downright dangerous for those with no option for private health care. Because they just, it's not just that they're going to have to pay extra for the treatment. They can't. So they just don't get the treatment. You know, you know they, they've got to be stuck on the waiting list as their health deteriorates under our deliberately undermined healthcare system. The third thing you would do is to bugger up healthcare in England. Because it's only England, remember, healthcare is devolved. So we can only mess it up in England. But to, to, to bugger up healthcare in England... Uh, just remove some services altogether. It's not like there's a long waiting list. This is just services, just not on the NHS. This again helps grow the private sector because then to get that treatment, you're going to have to go private. You grow the private sector because that's what you need to do. Grow the private sector to get it ready to take over completely. And they want that to be achieved quite soon now, I get the impression. The health and care bill is passing through Parliament right now, today, again, and it's going to achieve some of these methods. The British Medical Association has a number of concerns with the bill. It removes the rights of patients to legally challenge a lack of provision. So if there isn't a service that should be provided by the NHS provided, you can't now, after this bill goes through, if it goes through, if it becomes law, you won't be able to challenge it in the courts. So that basically means that trusts can stop services altogether and there's no legal recourse. Even though they're supposed to provide them, there'll be no legal recourse to force them. It also potentially leads to charges for certain services they've noted. Again, all part of the process. It removes what is already insufficient scrutiny over the award of private contracts through the NHS. Remember, the government have been funneling billions of pounds into mates and donors and all sorts over COVID. They were only able to do that through emergency legislation. Normally they wouldn't be, and they, they still shouldn't have done it in the way they did do it. But the, the fact that there was no scrutiny was because of COVID. They're looking ahead after when there's no emergency and for other contracts as well. They want to do the same thing, just award it to their mates, no scrutiny. This bill lays the groundwork to do that. You know, it allows private companies to sit on the boards of integrated care systems. And as the BMA points out, these people's priority is to their shareholders, not the care of people in the community. So we're going to have care policies in your area, if you're in England, Care policies will be guided by the interests of profit, not health. The BMA points out that the abolition of key bodies within the NHS structure is also going to help facilitate further privatisation. There are concerns about the control that this bill gives ministers to use patient data. Earlier this year, I did a video about how the government wanted to give away a load of our patient data. And there was a campaign to um, withdraw your consent for doing this. So many people took part in that campaign that the government backtracked on it and they went, oh, we're not going to do it after all that because they weren't going to have enough patient data. So now what they're going to do with this bill is make sure they don't need our consent. You know, they've already got a history, as I say, of, of giving it to private companies or trying to give it to private companies. You know, when our healthcare is fully privatised, remember what this data will be used for. It's already of commercial value now. 
But when we've got a fully privatised healthcare system, this data will be used to deny people affordable health insurance, just like in the United States. The BMA also came up with a series of proposals, neatly summarised by the 99% organisation. Thanks for passing that on. The bottom line is that the BMA say that this bill will do more harm than good. As such, it cannot support the bill. You know, when you're pushing a healthcare bill through Parliament that is opposed by professional healthcare organisations, you know that this should be facing an awful lot more scrutiny than it is. But of course it isn't. Likely it wouldn't anyway. Can't imagine most of the mainstream media picking this up even on a slow news day. But the days are actually filled with crisis after crisis. The health secretary, by his complete lack of action over COVID, is storing up another crisis. And another galling aspect of, of the way our health and social care department, which is supposed to lobby for health and social care, not act against it, but the way it's been run is that it is politically beneficial for the Conservatives to deliberately make a mess, deliberately make a mess of the most urgent health care need of our times because it will provide a lot of cover in the headlines to hide their destruction of the NHS. You know, I look at it as like, imagine seeing uh, the NHS in a bit of disrepair and you see a load of scaffolding going over it. You go, oh good, they're fixing it. But they're not. What they're actually doing behind the scaffolding is breaking it down and running off with all the copper wiring. And the whole process is gathering pace now. It, yeah, I mean, I said 2019 before the election, this was our last chance for a number of things. It wasn't the usual election where you go, oh, this is really important. Of course it's important. Um, but if you lost, you go, oh no. Right, we'll have to focus on the next one. You know, if we lost in 2019, there were things that were going to be permanently lost to us. We'd be out of the EU. Democratic systems were going to be torn down. And I said that our NHS would be impossible to rescue without a generation of work. It wouldn't be just a case of, uh, of getting the Tories out and then, and then another government come in and, and repair the damage. It wouldn't be possible to repair the damage. You know, um, we'd need to keep them out for a whole generation to restart it again. You know, the last Labour government was the first one to keep the Tories out of power for more than five years since the 1860s. And it is, it's, it's the only one to have kept them out of power for, for a decade since the 18th century. You know, I mean, in the 1860s, the Liberals kept them out only for six years. For 200 years, the Tories have only been kept on the opposition benches for two or three years at a time mainly. You know, Tony Blair, different thing. And the prospect of keeping them out of power for an extended period of time in the future without PR, it's impossible. It's not happening. I mean, it hasn't happened for 200 years. And they're even more entrenched now. But that is the only way we're going to reverse the damage that will now be done. Like, it can't be done in five years. It can't even be done in 10 years. I don't like to think what's going to be left of the NHS come the next election. It will be a shell with nothing but the name remaining. It won't be possible for a future non-Tory government to just sort the funding out. They're going to have to completely recreate the NHS again. Will they even be able to do that and how long would that take? But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Sorry about the noise, it's just fired up. Until next time, I'll see you later.